again and welcome to Forum for a Better Understanding. I can't believe that after 290 episodes of this series every week, there's one program we have not really done yet, and it's called Wisdom of Women, Women's Spiritual Leadership. And it's because for some reason, as you notice from the beginning of the very program with those opening shots, most of the guests that are on this program that represent leadership in the different faiths, it just seems that unfortunately we don't have enough women represented. And that is an issue that we are trying to address, believe it or not, all the time, but also today in this very program, because we have loaded it with some very <laughs> excellent guests who have been on before, but never as a trio. And we're so glad that we have three people from three very distinct traditions, with very different disciplines, different educations, different ministries, different experiences, who are all going to share with us the power of their positions, the leadership that they exercise, and the wisdom they'd like to share with us today, and not just today, but on an experience that they'll be sharing this coming weekend. So on that note, let me introduce our three very special guests today on the forum. The first would be the Reverend Dr. Grace Shearson, <laughs> who is a Zen Buddhist abbess. And I was there for that ceremony, a very impressive ceremony. And she is also a licensed clinical psychologist, which lets us know that there is someone here who has a lot of background, not only from her tradition as a Buddhist, but even professionally, clinically. And she'll tell you that her whole journey also includes other faiths. Across from me now, we have Natalie Chamberlain. Reverend Natalie is a disciple of Christ and is the pastor at the United Christian Church here in Fresno. Also coming to us with a very important scientific background as a biologist, chemist, chemist as a chemist, but also having been recently here in Fresno in a leadership role in the Interfaith Alliance of Central California. And it's a... Uh, it's just a wonderful effort that she is doing in her little community there on Weston Shields, but also branching out and leading many, many things among so many different faiths to include her own community with us and us with them. It's just been very rich, Natalie, so thank, thank you, you for that. And then, who's been on more times, almost as much as Grace, is Dr. Veena Kapoor who represents, as she always does, Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual Organization. Dr. Kapoor and her husband have been working in so many ways in interfaith dialogue, but in a particular way, Veena represents Raja Yoga, is a meditator and a teacher of meditation, and a wonderful influence in this community here. So we have three people who in different ways can share with us right now the riches of their own faith and how leadership is exercised by them as women. Grace, would you begin by almost telling us what you wanted to about yourself and your own journey towards the position that you now hold as an abbess? Well, I was born into a Jewish tradition and um, my family is Jewish. I still consider myself Jewish, but um, at the time that I found Buddhism, uh, there really wasn't a voice for women in my tradition. They weren't bat mitzvah at that time. There, well, that wasn't very common. And when I came to Buddhism, I found that the chants had been translated and women could participate fully. And once I, I had a taste of full participation, uh, that's what won me over to Buddhist meditation. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, Natalie, your own faith your discipleship of Christ faith? Well, my, uh, my faith, my practice within the Disciples of Christ was actually a, a rebellion against my upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was raised in, in the Catholic Church and didn't find a home there. I suspect it's a lot like yours, Grace, that I was, uh, it, the voice just wasn't there and I obviously am in a place now where that's very important. And so my, my great, um, sort of breaking out of that was to find another church, one where women have a long history of being in leadership. And uh, the Disciples of Christ have ordained women since the 1880s wow. in, for the Anglo women and in the 1840s for uh, African-American women. 
So we have for a long time included women in the ministry of the church. The roles, although being ordained, still weren't full par with some of the men up until about the 50s or 60s, but at least there was a place to practice and so to find a church where I could use those gifts and graces and to do it comfortably while I practiced chemistry. It was, <laughs> it was really, it was a wonderful mix, so it was a good place for me. Thank you. Now, I do think that Vina's gonna have a similar trajectory of moving from into. Vina, tell us a little bit about your own background. You know, I was uh, born and raised uh, as a Hindu in India, and I did uh, experience some of the splendor of worship of women as goddesses, and yet lived on a practical basis with contradictions of how women were treated. So that had been my journey to explore and find a more deeper meaning in, out of that. And it was much later in life that I came in contact with Brahma Kumari's World Spiritual Organization. We are a worldwide organization, and it's really a university, which began in 1936-37 in India. And uh, the whole message is based on spiritual values and how we can learn to express our spirituality going beyond differences of any organized faith as well as other differences of caste, color, gender. The leadership of our organization from day one has been women. And that was a radical uh, thing in 36, 37. Um, the founder of our organization, the founding father is a man, is a fiery fatherly figure but it was his vision to bring women in the front because he was convinced that if there had to be um, progress and emancipation and growth in the country and in the world, it would be through women. Mm -hmm. So he placed all his um, resources in their hands. So it, although we have centers in 120 countries now, all the centers, the main key players are always women but it is not a women's organization. There are equally men in it. Now, women generally, uh, men generally take uh, a backbone kind of role, and they're very much part of the organization. So I found a way through them, an uh, opportunity to really express my true self and realize who my true leadership from within. Vina, one question I've never asked you about the, let's say numerically, how many members Ballpark, Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual Organization, how many? On the ballpark, by now, 800,000 worldwide. And men and women, how do they split up? Um, that would be hard for me to guess, but I think there are more women, but there are equal, I think there are a good number of men too. There are places where men are also running the centers or in partnership with women, but it is, I've seen that even the men who are in that role, there is, they are transformed so much. I, I think that was probably what touched me the most, wow. is what I saw, and we refer to each other as brothers and sisters. And when I saw the young brothers, that's what impressed me the most, because I saw a certain transformation and integration of values, whether you call them masculine or feminine. Thank you. Sister Vina, thank you so much for reminding us of something that is, in a sense, so new. We think of Hinduism as ancient, right. but you're saying it's only in the 30s that we even have Brahma Kumaras World right. Spiritual Organization, so you're the new kid on the block. Correct. It's kind of exciting to see that all happen. Thank you. Grace, you have written a marvelous book. Thank I can you. say that because I read it, and I would never speak of a book saying, oh, a great book. I don't know what it is. It's actually wonderful. We did a program on this book a couple months ago. Tell us a little bit about what you learned in doing this research on these marvelous women. Well, you know, uh, it was very interesting, and it is interesting as Westerners, whenever we get a tradition brought to us from the old country, whether it's European or Asian, we take it on as, oh, we're the first ones doing it. We know everything. <laughs> and so... Uh, we didn't even know that women had practiced before, and we didn't see any women in the history of our tradition 
that were written about. And so, but yet we were being offered an opportunity, as I was, to come forward and take ordination as a Buddhist uh, priest in this country. And when I did it, it's like, well, now what? Who, who am I like? You know, when you're a child, you think about, gee, I, what do I want to be? And you have an image. I had no image. And so this yeah. is why I started researching what are women like in my tradition? What is the wisdom that they bring that is uniquely feminine that balances uh, what we've learned about our tradition? So if we study uh, the Zen Buddhist tradition from the women's perspective, we learn of a different kind of wisdom, the wisdom of endurance and acceptance rather than the wisdom of mastery. When we talk about a Zen master, there's no female equivalent for the word master. So we wouldn't say mistress because a mistress belongs to somebody. But uh, in terms of mastery of the tradition, there are uh, receptive and creative and caring parts of the tradition that are, do not show up in the stereotype of a ferocious master. And that's what I wanted to uncover in my book. And you did. Mm -hmm. And you introduced us to so many interesting women. Now, out of all of them, you probably do have some favorites. So narrowing even that field, is there one that you might like to give us some anecdotal that sort of like lets us who aren't acquainted with these interesting women um, one of them, can you flesh her out a little? Right. As I was saying about the mastery aspect of uh, Zen as a tradition, you know, you hear these expressions, I've conquered all the senses and all the drives, and I'm now master of my space. And the one uh, female that I most prefer wrote poetry. She had had a very difficult life. Her name was Rengetsu, and she lived in the uh, 18th century and 19th century. And um, one of the poems, I think, tells her story the best. Now, she lost her children, she lost two husbands, then she lost her adoptive father, and she had no place to live. And yet she continued to go on to write beautiful poetry, to make beautiful art, and to blossom as a human being. And what attracted me, in fact, to, the, to her teaching and to the female side of uh, Zen Buddhism was this poem. Uh, gazing at the crimson colors of autumn. Clad in black robes, I should have no attachments to the shapes and sense of, these, of this world. But how do I keep my vows gazing at today's crimson maple leaves? And I would say, how do I keep my vows holding my grandbaby in my arms or going by a shoe sale at Nordstrom or seeing <laughs> one of my friends and saying, oh, I want to cook a good meal for us together? In other words, this idea of detachment from the human realm, and this is what I liked about what Vina said about relationship. Uh, really, the spiritual values are not integrated through books. They're integrated through relationship. And what I like about Rengetsu's teaching is she doesn't say, I've, I've vanquished all my needs for human relationship or human needs. I see them, and I work with them, and I accept them. And that kind of transparency without having to be the master, but really sharing herself. How can I keep these vows? That's a question we all have. How do we keep these vows, even as human beings trying to integrate ourselves in our spiritual lives? Unfortunately, one vow I have is I have to take a break in the middle of the program. So we're going to take that one minute break now. Don't go anywhere, because we're going to be right back. For over 25 years, KNXT has been serving the people of the San Joaquin Valley with good family television. That's just not available anywhere else. It's important for you, the viewer, to help support this valuable tool of ministry. KNXT needs to continue to grow and bring you important programming about your faith. But sometimes it's hard to stop and find the time. Make it easy. Go to KNXT.TV and find out how easy it is to support your Catholic television station, KNXT-TV. Welcome back to our second part of our conversation with Women of Wisdom. Natalie, would you be able to pick up where uh, Grace left off and maybe work with your tradition? Some interesting historical anecdotal example of women. Women. Well, just being Christian and, and having access to, to Christian scriptures we know that women have been part of the Christian tradition since the very beginning with Jesus. But um, in my own Disciples of Christ tradition, the first woman who was ordained 
was uh, the history books. If you read her, if you go back to the, the texts that are required if you're going to be ordained, this woman is said to have been ordained in order to take advantage of a clause in the railroad laws at the time because ordained people were able to get half price rail fare. <laughs> and so this woman got ordained in order to take advantage of this. They, ref the, they left out of the history book the fact that this woman baptized over 3,000 people, started four churches, and worked as the solo pastor in at least five churches. But she was ordained in order to get cheap railroad fares. So the fact that women have always been a part of my tradition and that women have always been the backbone that Vina talked about, the men being in her tradition, so often they didn't get credit for what it was they did and they weren't recognized for being the leaders they truly were in, in their places. Vina, in your tradition, is there something more that you didn't share yet about the, um, the power of what your community is in this world. We think of India being obviously the birthplace of such great world religion. Tell us where maybe Brahma Kumara's World Spiritual Organization fits into that scheme and its own gift to the world. I think that what we uniquely stand for that we have moved away from the traditional practice of Hindu, Hinduism. That is, we do not engage in any of the traditional practice, but we try to find an understanding and the significance behind the worship of gods and goddesses. There is a tremendous amount of symbolism and very rich stories that uh, uh, really unravel for a person the true meaning uh, of spirituality. And what we have come to understand that really we need to give importance to who we are as spiritual beings. And as Reverend Grace mentioned earlier too, that we do recognize like the poem you just shared, that we need to really see ourselves in a role as being spiritual and all the roles that we play are part of our lives. But I, I'm not the role I play. It is our identification with the roles that sometimes gets us into a different position, but I can maintain that detachment from it and remain focused and centered in my spirituality. The power is in that, that when we can retain our spirituality and are not influenced by environment or external situations, because we have the choice to feel and think what we want and not be led by other situations. And that awareness and that grounding comes through deep practice of meditation and insight that we can develop. And I think that gives a very solid foundation internally. I think that's where we stand out very unique. Now there's going to be an event that we'd like to let you know about right now and we're going to put it on the screen. There is going to be a an experience at the Unitarian Universalist Church. So maybe we could be posting that up on the monitor now. And then why don't you tell us something about what's going on? Well, I'd like to say that uh, we came together um, because we enjoy each other's company. <laughs> and yes. it's, um, we enjoy uh, learning from each other's faith. Um, but as Vina just described, um, there is something deeply spiritual in all of us, and it gets uh, swamped by personal fears and by cultural um, uh, norms that we've been taught. And in particular, women um, naturally, more naturally so, the uh, biologists are finding this out, wish to please and care for others. And if that turns into a denial of themselves, and they do not have the strength to speak. And if they use a spiritual tradition to um, repress themselves even further, this is not finding their spiritual strength. So um, I think we will come together to talk about just that, how in each of our traditions we found strength to speak, the importance of formal training, 
And as Vina described, this is a selfless act. This is not for me to become the great abbess of North Fork. It is for me to stand up as a woman so other women can see me and the tradition then is enriched by the participation of women and the planet is helped by the power of women to care for and nurture rather than just uh, we've had a few problems with wars and so on. So I think yes. we could use a little uh, a softer touch on the, on the planet. So this is what we're going to come together to talk about. We'll also have women uh, representing the Jewish tradition and the Unitarian tradition there. Now, one thing that we posted just now was that workshop that takes place on the weekend, April 3rd at the Unitarian Universalist Church, uh, 10.30 to 1 o'clock, uh, 1.30 p.m., and it's going to be that you would call Carolyn Murphy, 284-1795, to register for that. But I think some people watching this program are not going to be able to make it to that event. We barely have enough time to talk about it before it happens. But there are ways to be in touch with our three speakers today, our three guests. So if we put on that screen, let's see if we could see how you'd be in touch with Grace, Natalie, and Sister Vina. Now... This is the website. Tell us about your website, and then why don't the others also tell us ways to reach you by your email. Okay, my website, I have a, a Zen temple up in the foothill, so it's emptynestzendo.org, like when your kids leave home, empty nest. Empty nest. <laughs> empty nest .org, and there's the phone number for it, and that is uh, where we can be reached. Vina, what is your phone number? And then also throw out your um, the email address. Yeah. Whatever activities we do in Fresno is from our home, actually. So the, my phone number is 435-2212. And the email is rajayoga108 at gmail.com. And Veena often has programs out of her house, and we are posting them both on our community calendar at Channel 49, so you probably have seen things happening with Brahmakumara's World Spiritual Organization and also on our website at the station, knxt.tv. So Vina and the projects that she is offering, many, many weekends there are projects. Natalie, tell us about how to reach you and also about your, um, your own disciplesfresno.org. The, the number that was listed is my church's number, 227-2050, and the, that's the easiest way to reach me. That one usually finds me. But um, my congregation also has a website, disciplesfresno.org, and it gives a better idea of not only who we are as a, commun as a worshiping community within the larger community, but also would give you the opportunity to find other ways to contact me. There's email addresses and that sort of thing available. We unfortunately have a few minutes left uh, only, but let's try one question that I'd like each of you to give a, a short response to. The way you look at it, what are some unique needs of women and correspondingly unique gifts? Not that they're exclusively female, but these are strong needs of women spiritually and strong gifts spiritually. Grace. I think that the unique gifts that women have are that they're naturally uh, wanting to help others. This is in their biology. They can really feel the feelings of others, and they've been trained to. And I think what they need to develop is a little bit of selfishness and recognizing that taking care of everybody else's needs first, they may not develop themselves as fully as they can. And developing yourself fully is the greatest gift you have to offer others. Interesting. Every mm. blessing is a curse. So That's it's great exactly to think right. you can always work mm. on those blessings and not let them curse you. Yes. Natalie. I, what Grace was saying, I, I use slightly different words, but I think empathy, that, that being able to feel with, to, to be with people in my congregation as they go through the different experiences and different parts of their lives, I, it. I think that's something that women normally or generally do better than men do. Not that there aren't men who are very good at it, but it's something that seems to really make a connection between me and the people of my congregation oh, yeah. and the people of my larger neighborhood. And um, one of the, the gifted pieces that makes that easier, I think, is the, um, the ability for, for me to tell stories 
and, and to be able to incorporate people into the stories of my life, the stories of the community, the stories of the people around me. And, and everybody likes to be part of a story. And, and when they can see themselves getting woven into that, I think that's a, a, a gift that I personally bring and not just, uh, and maybe, maybe other women are good storytellers too, but it's the way I've found to express my ministry in my community. Sister Vina, the gift and the need that you in your life's experience see. I think the women. gift that women have, you know, just uh, adding to what was already said is cooperation mm -hmm. and being uh, loving to um, many more individuals uh, and being giving. That's a really special qualities that the world needs right now. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to develop more sense of self-respect and confidence within our own self and not see the, our spiritual values as something that makes one vulnerable, but rather it is empowering. Mm -hmm. And that's where women need to move towards more self-respect. Let's post that up one more time, if we could, that workshop that's coming up, that experience at the Univer uh, Universalist, Uni Unitarian Universalist Church, because that's where some of these concepts will be developed. Not exclusively, there'll be other ways to do that, but if you could see that now, it's Saturday, it's coming right up, you contact Carolyn, and then you'll know that there's also ways to reach our three guests by their phone numbers, websites, and email addresses. If you can be in touch with the abbess, or the doctor, or the reverend, you will know that there are ways to find out more from them about what they talked about. I think this was, for me, a very enriching experience because mostly around this table, as around a lot of board tables, <laughs> as around a lot of places except in the kitchen, you will find <laughs> men talking a lot. It was great having three good friends here today on the forum, and I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did, and that you'll be back next week for another program, but that before that, you'll check out the information about these three guests and pursue their lead and find out more about the wisdom of women and their spiritual leadership. God bless.